Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the panel, 3040 Social Studies, Arts in a Changing Arlington. Tonight's uh, event is presented in partnership with Arlington Public Art. We're very happy about that. Um, and thank you for coming tonight. This mic is fake for you guys. <laughs> Only real for these guys, so if you're wondering why I'm not amplified, I've got to do that naturally. So <laughs> I should have told you that. It seems weird for me to be holding a mic and you, and you not to hear me amplified. Um, my name is Stephanie Fetter. I'm the director of the Arlington Art Center. The Arlington Art Center is a 40-year-old contemporary art center, and it was started four decades ago by a group of artists and citizens who wanted to find a place for artists in our area to make work. We have one of them here tonight. <laughs> Who's still with us, Ann Hancock. Um, today our mission is still to help artists in our area make and present new work. We do this for persons of all ages and interests, um, all levels of ability through our classes, um, the highest level through our studio residency program, which is really unlike any other in our area, and through pr provocative exhibitions of the region's best artists. Um, we have a fabulous show up right now. We've got two of the curators here. Judy Byron, who's curated our home show, and Jarvis Dubois of Present Body. So if you have a moment to look at the shows, please do. It's really fabulous work. Um, when I took over the directorship three years ago, it was exciting for me to really learn what had happened here, who'd come through here, who'd shown work here, who'd made work here, but also to envision where this art center could go. Um, of a, cal a caliber organization like this, where it could go, who it could reach. Um, and so this past year has really been spent both looking back as well as looking forward. And we've done that through a couple of exhibitions, one that's on view right now, and we've invited past curators to come back and uh, sort of reinvent and reinvigorate old exhibitions through a contemporary lens. Um, one thing that's also been important to AAC over the years is that we've always had a staff of curators. And so our esteemed panel tonight is one that got their early starts here at AAC. We're gonna learn about um, past work, present work, and really what it means to be involved in an arts field over a period of time. Tonight we have the great pleasure of hearing from this accomplished panel uh, to learn what it takes to remain relevant, impactful, and at the forefront of visual arts. Um, we also have the great pleasure of co-presenting the event with Arlington Public Art, directed by Angela Adams and her team, Deirdre Ellen, Eliza Schiff, who um, we've spent a year talking about this, so we're excited to bring this here to you tonight. Um, tonight's panel will be moderated by Michael O'Sullivan. Michael O'Sullivan is a staff writer for the Washington Post, specializing in art and film criticism. That's as much as <laughs> he wanted to share, but he's going to, he's going to share a little bit of his personal history with AAC tonight, and I'm, I'm excited to hear that. Um, but I want to thank Michael and all of our esteemed panelists for being here tonight. Um, taking time out of their schedules, and also to thank you to come here tonight, learn about what we think we've done in this community, and how we hope to continue moving forward. So thank you. Hi. Um, I like short and sweet, so uh, that's, that's, that's my bio, that, uh, and I'm sticking to it. Um, <laughs> I will give uh, a, little, a little bit more background. Um, I think uh, part of the reason of why I was invited to come and moderate this, uh, this conversation, and I, and I hope it is a conversation. Um, that's not a threat, but by the way. But, <laughs> um, you look sort of panicked, Jeffrey, for, <laughs> for a moment. Um, it's, it's just my longevity. Uh, I, I remember one of, I, I have sort of a fond nostalgia for this place, given the fact that uh, when I first, shortly after I first started at the Washington Post 21 years ago, um, one of the first stories I wrote was a, on the occasion of Arlington Arts Center's 20th anniversary. Um, it hardly seems possible <laughs> that I am that old. Uh, I, I interviewed um, Carol Sullivan, who was the, the director then, and I believe the interview, uh, someone sat in on the interview, and that was Kristen Heilman, uh, who was, uh, like, like me, a baby at the time. Um, and she couldn't be with us tonight, but uh, she, was, she was a curator here and has moved on, as everybody who has come through the center seems, 
seems to have done, uh, moved on to great things. Uh, anyway, the, this, uh, in, this, in this interview, Carol Sullivan complained about the, the uh, perhaps somewhat tongue in cheek about the low visibility of the, uh, the Arlington Art Center uh, in contrast with, uh, with some other re regional nonprofit art centers like uh, Rockville Arts Place and Maryland Art Place and <laughs> et cetera. Uh, and and she, she wished for a Starbucks across the street to, to cha <laughs> magically, magically transform things. That, was, that quote was in the article that she said, I just, I'm, just wish there were a Starbucks. Um, and now there is, and, and this, is, this is what made, this is what has made Arlington's Art Center the, what it is today, is that, um, that's, I say that in jest, because um, as I was talking to, a, to an artist friend of mine who reminded me that even 20 years ago, it wasn't quite true that Arlington Art Center had a low profile. I mean, Arlington Art Center, even 20 years ago, was, uh, was very much in the vanguard and, and, and doing exciting things. And Arlington County as, as a whole was also um, acknowledged for, for uh, its, its boldness and its commitment to, to art. Uh, in 1998, I think it was Arlington, um, Arlington County won an award from, uh, uh, from a, uh, a group affiliated with, the, with Harvard um, for innovation in, in arts. And uh, the, the lead, I didn't write that article, but the lead to that article said, uh, there's an arts boom underway in, in Arlington County, which was true then, and, and, and it seems to have, uh, have continued to today. Um, my, my very first art review was also a review of a show that involved the Arlington Art Center. It was not specifically just a show in Arlington at the Arlington Art Center, it was a show um, involving 13 regional nonprofit art centers, Greater Reston Art Center, Th School 33, Maryland Art Place, Rockville Art Place, DCAC, etc. It was uh, called Art Sites 96, and it was coincidentally Judy Byron. It was on the theme of home, um, but it was a very different show from from your show, which which seems to have uh, which, you know. Uh, kind of a different conceptual take, uh, um, more maybe more thought-provoking ideas about what the nature of home is. Um, I've I've been thinking about some of these things as I've been thinking about uh, how to kind of start this conversation, and I want to sort of throw the door open to tonight's chat by uh, expressing uh, something that has occurred to me about both about uh, the Arlington Arts Center as a representative of the um, municipally funded regional arts center and, and Arlington Public Art as a uh, municipally funded public art program. These, these institutions seem to exist in liminal, liminal spaces in the art ecosystem. And I want to, um, I want to plumb the thoughts of some of the people on the panel, whom I will introduce more specifically in a second, um, about their thoughts on this, this, this place, Arlington Arts Center's place in this ecosystem and the Arlington Public Arts place in the ecosystem. Um, each of you, to me, seems especially well situated to, uh, to evaluate this sort of liminal space, these liminal, these liminal institutions. Um, Angela Anderson Adams is the director of Arlington Public Art, um, a, an institution that, as she put it to me in a recent phone conversation, sort of deals with this push-pull, the, the, the push-pull between uh, popular taste and the public good, you know, art that's maybe good for you, that is fiber, and art that tastes good, that has, like, you know, <laughs> sugar-coated <laughs> flakes. Um, Andrea Polin is the director of uh, the Art Gallery Curator's Office. And as she also put it recently in a um, perhaps somewhat tongue-in-cheek Facebook post, she, ha she, she comes from this, again, sort of betwixt and between two worlds the wor the as a high priestess of art um, in her roles in nonprofits, and she will tell you a little bit more about that, and her, um, in her role as a dealer, you know, trying to sell art. Jeffrey Cudlin at the very end of the panel is uh, 
coming from a background as, as an artist himself, so as a maker of traditional objects, as a painter, and has transitioned over time um, into a, a, a critic, uh, a curator. Uh, he's now the, um, I have, better get this right, he's now a, a full-time faculty member at ba Baltimore's Maryland Institute College of Art, where he's a professor of curatorial studies and practice. That's a mouthful. Um, so anyway, in, in throwing this, this, this door open, I, I would like to maybe invite each of you, we'll move down the panel, each of you to uh, tell the, tonight's audience a little bit more, more about yourself, where you're coming from, uh, what your background is in maybe in more depth, how that brought you to the Arlington Art Center as a curator, what you did or hoped to do while you were there, and how you transitioned from that to where you are now. And, uh, and then we'll move into the sort of broader conversation about where these liminal institutions are in the, in the broader art ecosystem. So Angela, will we sure. start with you? <clears throat> yes, thank you. And we are recording this event so that we can post it to YouTube and have it available for people who couldn't be here tonight. So thank you for your patience with that. Um, so I uh, am delighted to be the director of Arlington Public Art. I've worked for Arlington County for about 20 years and 15 of those years uh, more or less have been focused on the art program in Arlington, the public art program. Um, I came to um, Arlington uh, through, uh, I guess, having been uh, grown up here in DC and went to school in the Midwest and came back after my graduate work and. Uh, got a job as an art consultant, the wonderful Jean Efron, who's still doing what she does very well. Um, but I really wanted to be a curator, and I didn't really know that by the time I was, uh, well, I guess I did. I had a couple of wonderful internships while I was in college, one at the Baltimore Museum of Art and one at the Hirshhorn. And I'd say by the end of my graduate work, I, I wanted to do that. So um, worked for Jean for a while and started to learn a little bit about the business aspect, which they didn't teach us at that point in time. I didn't go to Williams. I didn't have that wonderful art and business kind of mentality, uh, which was present then uh, in the mid to late 80s, but um, came back and um, wanted to stay in the area and was lucky enough to be hired when the Arlington Art Center was finally ready to hire their first professional as in paid curator position. Um, previously, there have been a wonderful artists and Judy Byron among them who volunteered through the exhibition committee to organize exhibitions. Uh, that I think was a model they've fallen back on as they have been in between curators. Um, so that served them well given the talent in this area. Uh, but it, it helped me certainly launch my career. It taught me a lot about what living artists are like because I was an art historian and we didn't really have the benefit of getting to know the studio artists, although they were there for some reason. It just never dawned on me, I guess, to go meet them. So um, <laughs> in my career here, I started to meet living artists and I got very excited. I uh, developed a bit of a reputation for doing studio visits, Richmond to Baltimore. I spent... Um, a day a week, I think, on the road meeting artists. And um, we really felt that this became kind of a hub for emerging talent in the region. Um, worked with Kathy Freshly and the late Barbara Franz to uh, really make this place dynamic and exciting and a, give it a sense of community so it wasn't just me um, by any stretch. Um, and uh, from there, uh, basically went to the Women's Museum, National Museum of Women in the Arts, and started a regional program for them. And through many recessions, <laughs> we uh, kind of uh, ran out of steam there in terms of fundraising. And uh, I was finally offered a job directing the Ellipse Arts Center. So I think you may have reviewed my show as part of Art Sites 96, or whatever it was. I did. <laughs> Uh, but I uh, was offered, Sorry, I forgot to that's all right, that's all right, that's all right. Maybe it wasn't memorable and that's okay too. No, but, no. Um, but um, uh, I was only mentioning once it still exists. <laughs> so I ran the Ellipse Arts Center for several years and that morphed into a community arts position and then that morphed into helping the county launch a public art program officially. Uh, we're celebrating our 30th anniversary because we started as a developer-funded program, one of the first in the country to actually start that way and continue that way. And it took the county then about 16 years to catch up with itself and ask itself to provide art in its own program, its own projects rather. So that's what the policy brought us in 2000. Then we wrote a master plan and guidelines and hired wonderful staff. We've got some former staff here as well as 
current staff, um, and it's really taken all of us to, um, I think, put the program on the map the way I believe it is uh, now, and I actually have a public art committee member here, John Hensley. We, we really, it's a team effort. It, you don't make these projects happen. You don't work in local government without a lot of multi-layered support and different skills to make it happen. So hopefully that addressed what you asked. Thank you. Andrea, you want to tell us a little bit more about yourself and how you got here? Um, sure. Uh, so I think I have a bit of the opposite experience <laughs> of Angela because in college, I, I don't have a graduate degree, by the way, but in college I used to love, and I was an art historian, uh, to hang out in the studios of graduate students. And that's how I really learned about art far more than the art history classes I was taking. So um, I felt like that was my mother's milk. I always needed to hang out with artists and um, came to DC by default, long story, but um, started working in the gallery world on DuPont Circle. Back then everything was located on our street and I was working in a gallery there and then a gallery in Georgetown. You won't know them because they long closed. Um, but I was also wanting to do a lot of guerrilla projects. And I got together with art critic, curator, and artist Jim Mahoney. And he and I did our first little crazy show in a little apartment. And then from there, it went from guerrilla project to guerrilla, to guerrilla project, and it got bigger and bigger. And finally, the Blagden Alley warehouse, where you will now find Adamson Editions, was a building that was offered to me to do big projects. And I think Kathy Freshly, who was then the director at AAC, and believe me, I have such love and affection and respect for that woman, came to see the show I was working on because Angela was leaving. Angela had just gotten the job at the National Museum, Museum of Women, Women in the Arts, Arts. Yeah. and Kathy came by and had, she said she had been following my guerrilla projects, which who knew? Um, <laughs> but she came by and really loved the shows and then asked me to come in and interview for the job as curator. And at that time, I didn't see myself as an institutional creature at all. I'm very kind of rebellious and fiercely independent. But um, I said, OK, I really enjoyed what Kathy and Angela had been doing at the Art Center. I would come by to see every show. The home show she did here was spectacular. Um, so the irony is I, I'm probably like the bumpy curator here, because the year I came aboard, I really wanted to work with Kathy as a director when Angela had left. And within a week of my getting here, Ange uh, Kathy said, I'm retiring. You're like, <laughs> what? Then my whole reason for coming to work with the AAC was to work with you and, and your incredible vision. So it was a very weird year in that Kathy retired. The board was looking for a new director. They hired Tim Close, who was wonderful in the museum world. I'm not sure he was comfortable with the nonprofit world. It's a totally different world than the museum world. At the same time, the uh, recession, the real estate recession happened. This was 1992. And all our money dried up. I mean, everything dried up. So I stayed here a year, and I was really not a curator. I was an exhibition coordinator for a lot of inherited programming. But I got to meet so many wonderful artists, and I'm still very close friends with many of them. Um, but I got laid off. Yay. <laughs> I did too, actually. Yeah. Um, luckily, at the same time, though, I was also being uh, in dialogue with McLean Project for the Arts. And I was working here full time, and then I also had another part-time job working for McLean Project for the Arts, which then snowballed into my being there for 10 years um, as their exhibitions director. So I have to kind of, I feel like it's important to talk about those dark years of a nonprofit institution. There are times the money completely dries up. The board was running this institution with a, a, somebody who was really more a museum person and a lot of volunteers. And it went through like kind of a, a fairly bumpy ride there. Um, the building was ancient. The, I remember the electrical board was from 1929. The furnace exploded when I was here. I mean, flooding. it flooded, flooding. it flooded like crazy. <laughs> this institution right now is so a luxury institution compared to what Angela and I used to work with. Um, so, but in this time, I, like I said, I was an exhibition coordinator. There were some fun solo exhibitions, a really cool mail art and zine show that an artist from Baltimore curated um, called Collateral Damage, a very political show. Um, but I didn't really actually get to curate anything. So, um, so I then went to McLean Project for the Arts, and then 10 years there, I left and decided to go out on my own, taking my background as a, I'd also been a corporate curator simultaneously. I've like always worn a lot of hats. Um, taking that job as a corporate curator for the artery organization, AAC, um, working at commercial galleries, working at university galleries and when I was in college, and decided to go out on my own. And that's how Curator's Office got started which was meant to be a curatorial project, 
and it wound up being a commercial gallery. That was not my intention. So, you know, you just have to be fluid and ride the waves of opportunity as they come to you. Um, so that's been 10 years now, and I just celebrated my 10th anniversary with Curator's Office, and I'm very intrigued about how the future goes. Foon Sham, I, Foon and I worked so hard on a public project outside. Foon had this wonderful sculpture out there, and Kathy Freshly, before she left, God bless her, took me to every permit office in Arlington to so we can get Foon's big, huge, it was, uh, the, it was like an arch with a ladder um, going up. That was very complicated to get all the permits, but Kathy knew exactly how to rubber stamp this project and bulldoze it through, and that's the reason I wanted to work with Kathy, but so that's my kind of other side of the story of Angela. <laughs> and then... Jeffrey, Jeffrey. that's me. So um, I was actually trained as a painter. I went to University of Maryland College Park and uh, was doing fairly conservative still life painting, actually, is what I did when I got there. Um, and what I discovered over the course of graduate school was, first off, there were lots of other things that I could do, and that's a dangerous thing if you're a studio artist, when your peers discover that you are good at helping them write grants or cleaning up their artist <laughs> statements, or um, the minute someone discovers, you know, when you have a number of, a lot of artist peers and they discover you can write, they're, but you can write, you know, they're, they're pulling you out of your studio. But um, I also found as I was uh, um, finishing graduate school that a lot of the things that interested me about art and being in the art world had nothing to do with what was happening in my studio and had to do with what was happening in everyone else's studios. And I increasingly found that that energy, this, all of these people jostling together in this conversation that is contemporary art, that was what was interesting to me and not so much what I could do in eight hours with a bunch of oily pigments and a, you know, a substrate. That, was, that wasn't so much of interest. So when I got out of grad school, I just immediately began making strange left turns. Um, I started writing for the Washington City paper. I started trying to organize shows for my friends and doing all sorts of things I had no business doing and didn't know how to do. Um, and it culminated in this show that I did that was a, a fake retrospective for a non-existent DC art movement uh, called the Washington Body School, where we were just sort of saying, you know, what if the art history of, uh, of the District of Columbia had unfolded very differently, and what if we could reclaim that legacy? So it was shortly after that that the position came open or I was aware, became aware that they were hiring at AAC for a director of exhibitions and I really felt like I had no business you know, having this job but I had curated this phony show so I felt like <laughs> maybe that would, someone would let that fly in. But for some reason uh, uh, Claire Huschel who was the, the um, executive director then and I really hit it off and she, she saw something in me that I wasn't sure that I saw. But uh, um, so she gave me the job and the opportunity and um, I really felt like I'd gotten away with something when I got here. And in terms of thinking about what AAC is and sort of its relationship to where it's cited and to DC and then to sort of a more national conversation, I just feel like you can get away with things here. There's, there's a sense in which you have permission to do, to try to do things that are a little larger than you should do them. Um, and, and as long, and, and be able to take some risks, and that's sort of how I approached coming to AAC. The other thing I saw as my mission when I got here is I looked at our mission statement, and it said what it said about mid-Atlantic artists and supporting the work of regional artists, and I saw during my four-year tenure that somehow I was going to shoehorn the phrase, comma, national, comma, and international into the end of that you sentence. you know how hard it was to get to mid-Atlantic? To mid <laughs> no, because when I got here, it was just regional. I had to right. fight for mid-Atlantic, yeah. so God And I was like, there's two more that are going into that sentence. Um, because... I felt like, you know, not, not that I wanted to turn, certainly not that I wanted to turn a blind eye to, to artists who live in Arlington, artists who live in D.C. or in the area, and that's always going to be the center of the mission, but I, I feel like, you know, one, a, a regional art scene can get really provincial and self-satisfied when it's not looking outside of itself, and two, a regional art scene can have a, a self-image problem and really feel like that there's, there's that, that don't realize how wonderful you are unless you are hanging cheek to jowl with people who are participating in the same conversation and using the same ideas and the same histories. So my thought was, any show we do here, I want to bring somebody who's, you know, people who are young and hungry here, people who have been doing the Lord's work here, people who are young and hungry in New York, people who are, who are are established there and people who have no business being at AAC that are gonna make you know our insurance company nervous and we're gonna bring them here too. So <laughs> that was what I wanted to do. And over the course of four years, you know, I, I felt like you know Claire allowed me to, to get into trouble and we put on some really great and adventurous shows and tried to tackle some topics that were really rewarding and build relationships with artists who even live, you know, down the street that I got to work with and that Andreas worked with as well. And I really benefited from the support of so many people who 
didn't think it was crazy that I worked here. Andrea, for one, I would, I would bother you almost every day, I feel like, asking you questions as soon as I, I mean, and, or Velma Lonstra, who was, you know, of course, with Angela and down the street, and I would just, lots and lots of questions, and she, in a similar way, led me through the process of permitting a couple of projects, and I had no idea what I was doing, and clutching my strange diagrams where I'd Xerox the plans for the building and in ballpoint pen and white out, you know, indicated projects on them. Um, but it was just really uh, uh, such an education and really taught me so much. Um, and I ended up leaving because I felt like I'd gotten to a point I went to MICA where I was going to be teaching students how to make public art and how to work in communities and how to be independent curators, which was something I had just barely figured out myself over four years. But I always feel like the curatorial profession is something where you're allowed um, this luxury of, of sort of the cultivation of the self, this idea that you, you take on projects that you don't know anything about. Um, and you learn about them, and you learn about the people you work with as you do those projects. What uh, Mary Jane Jacob calls a, well, she doesn't call it, but it's, I guess it's the, the Buddhist idea of the mind of don't know. You go in and you don't know what's going to come of the conversation. You don't know what's going to come of the artist's project, but you, you allow yourself to occupy that space, and then things come to be known. And so I went to Micah with that same idea that I would teach, but that I would also learn how to do things that I haven't had the chance to do here yet in an environment that, that's very different from, from Arlington. So that's been my journey, and I pretty much owe everything to this, this building, which changed a lot even during the four years I was here. So. Um, you, you mentioned a phrase that I think is, uh, I'll use as a segue to, uh, to the, the next stage of the conversation. You, you said uh, a place like this allows you to get away with things. And, and I'd like to, um, I mean, that seems connected to uh, what I was originally sort of mulling, and ruminate, mulling over and ruminating on about uh, these, these two institutions. Um, the, what, what, what one can get away with um, and can't get away with in, in a regional nonprofit like Arlington Arts Center. And it, similarly, because you, Angela, you have uh, experience both in public art and at the Arts Center, again, what one can not get away with or can get away with in the realm of public art. I mean, there are different sort of market forces. Um, and Arlington Public Art has kind of spanned quite a, well, maybe not the, the, the organization, but public art in Arlington has meant many different things. Um, I think you told me the, the first piece of public art was uh, Nancy Holt's Dark Star Park, but which is kind of just like a nice, somewhat safe, uh, piece of, you know, uh, landscape and, and, and art and sculpture. Um, but it also, I mean, Arlington as county has funded things, like we, when we talked on the phone, funded things like Alberto Gaetan's um, loci. Lo loci, which was a sort of a, almost a performance with rubber strips in, the, in on Lorcombe Lane, and, and it was a piece of music that, that would then subsequently be played when you drove your car over it at a specific speed. And there was some, there was a certain, I mean, there was certain controversial issues around that because neighbors complained about the noise, for one thing. I mean, it wasn't, didn't, it didn't necessarily have, uh, uh, like, a scandal or controversy or, or some sort of, pol you know, political, inflammatory political content. But, but there were issues, you know, about that connected to the idea of what one can get away with and cannot get away with. So maybe we can talk about that a little bit in terms of these two institutions. And since you're nodding your head and sitting next to me. Uh, we'll just jump in with you and, and positioning both both of these institutions in the in in the ecosystem uh, in terms of those restrictions and freedoms that uh, that that are the, 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 under which they operate. Yeah. Okay. So um, I mean, I've had the advantage of working for the Art Center, which, just to be clear, and Stephanie knows this, the, the building is owned by the county. The park on the outside, the grounds are owned by the county, but the nonprofit of the Arlington Art Center runs the gallery, and you have to fundraise for that. Um, and, of course, all of my funding comes from the county, so I have the benefit having inherited a developer-funded program to really have a good base funding for what I do, because every time there's a new building in the county, for the most part, I get a cash contribution for public art to offset, it's, it's for community benefit, but it's to offset uh, the imposition of new development in, in our community. Um, so I t use those dollars as per our policy and our master plan 
in ways that uh, are civic in their mindedness. And some of the ways we've done that actually is to help sponsor temporary public art. So to get to what you were saying, I think the risk taking in public art happens almost exclusively um, in the temporary realm because projects like the one we dedicated yesterday on Arlington Boulevard between Courthouse Road and 10th Street, uh, that took 10 years. And the artist, thank God, had done these sort of projects before and actually taught us how to do them and taught our state DOT how to do them. But by the time it was done, there was very little risk uh, other than the fact that none of our highway projects have this rusted grill work that's based on the pattern of a, of a um, red bud tree heart-shaped leaf, which is what the whole uh, mechanically stabilized earthen wall concrete pattern is all based on and will, in a couple of weeks, have a backlit uh, presence at night. So that's risk-taking in permanent public art, but temporary public art really is the realm where we can experiment. Um, we can work with a place like the Arlington Art Center to help fund their expressions on their lawn, which often come out of uh, what's happening here. We worked with a project that Jeffrey had some involvement in, Supernova, uh, that Philippa Hughes organized for the Roslyn bid and helped them, help JJ McCracken uh, develop an interactive project with our Dark Star Park. Um, and are maybe thinking about asking her to do something else in the future uh, that may or may not involve our permanent collection and that piece. Um, so we uh, are constantly trying to find ways to take our funding and find the folks who are able to take the risks, like Arlington Arts Center, and in the case of, you know, Philippa working with the bid, do things that ask questions that most of the rest of what we do really can't ask. So um, I hope that gets at what you were. Yeah. Okay. Jeffrey, do you want to jump in and talk about Supernova or, or uh, maybe since you were, I think you were here at uh, the Arlington Arts Center the longest, talk about these sort of, uh, this push pull between um, popular taste, uh, you know, the, the people who are coming from Starbucks, if anyone just wanders in from Starbucks, and the people who make this a, a mecca, a destination, who come here because they know there's going to be interesting, challenging art. Well, yeah, sure. I, I mean, I, I had this belief, and maybe it's sort of a misguided or even evangelical belief while I was here, that, you know, that the good stuff wins in the end, and that, that taste, to a certain extent, um, I mean, if art is, is doing what it should do, I mean, you can both provide spectacle for people and also have them leave the place feeling like the world is a more complicated place than it was when they walked in. Um, so the, the, that was sort of the, the two-pronged attack I always saw, is like, can we do something that occupies the space in a really, if not, you know, a pleasing way, if it's not, I, I did at one point, I remember um, maybe midway through my tenure, have a board member come to me and say, are you going to hang something on a wall that somebody could buy at some point while you're here? And I said, well, it might happen, because I was doing videos and performance and all of these you know, sort of temporary installations, and that was the stuff that I loved, you know, big, strange things that got destroyed at the end of the show. Um, but, you know, part of that for me was that this idea that, um, you know, we, we can, you can talk about, you, you can provide an experience, and there are levels at which people can engage that experience, just the pure, purely sort of visceral you know, quantity of stuff and scale and, and things that are unnerving or unusual, and then you can invite them in to sort of think about what that might or might not have to do with being a person and living in this society. So, so taste for me was always, you know, I, I, you can have spectacle and you can stir things up and you don't necessarily have to make people happy. <laughs> sort of maybe the way, and maybe that's, that's, that doesn't sound like, I, I, I don't know that that, that 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 was a concern for me. That said, I hear everything that Angela's saying about, you know, I, I was always very aware at AAC that we could take risks in the sense that we could do things on a really short timeline, um, provided A, you could do it with little or no money, and you know, B, you didn't have to get a group of people around a table and get consensus. You know, it's like if it's really, if it's just us and we can figure out a way to do this, the sky is the limit. Um, so 
you know, on the plus side, you know, we didn't have this apparatus. It was just, you know, four or five people in the office. And if all of us, if none of us, you know, hit the panic button after an idea was discussed, then we could do it. And uh, if that meant that, you know, an intern and I had to get in a van and drive for two days straight without sleeping and, you know, to get artwork in three different cities, and we would do it. So, so yeah, there, there's a sense in which, yeah, sure, if you don't need the buy-in of a lot of different people, you can do whatever you'd like. But then that also does limit the sorts of things you can do. Um, so during my tenure, while I felt like I was proud of the ways that we would engage issues and the ways that, that we would have challenging subject matter and the idea of, of public art, we did some stuff on the lawn, but I don't feel like we really did those kinds of projects. We talked about them. We brought Mel Chin here, and, and um, that's fabulous. But in terms of, of the kinds of things I'm trying to push my students to do at MICA, I think partly because of the timelines we were looking at and the way in which we saw ourselves as this nucleus, you know, this, this us against the world sort of mentality, that wasn't so much the mission while I was here. So, Did you have to work with an exhibition committee? Yeah, although I didn't really talk to them. <laughs> I feel like, I feel like Cla that was Claire's job, and Claire, Claire, I felt like things were going fine if she had to talk to them and I didn't, then everything must be going well. That, that you know, if there was an issue, she would, she would run interference and that would, that would so uh, there was, but I didn't really, I mean, the board was tremendously supportive and we, you know, and the board participated in when we would jury for solos, there were always board members involved in that and with our programs, but I just mean in the sense that, you know, there was no moment of tension where I had to get up and give a PowerPoint to, you know, a group of responsible adults who could tell me no, so. Lucky you. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, so. You know, and actually the opposite is true in public art. So I mentioned John Hensley's here, he's an architect, he's on our public art committee, and I can't do things without their input, be, and I wouldn't want to because we are, we don't have that skill set. So I have to rely, doing the work I do, on architects and engineers and landscape architects and folks who've done this, this work in other capacities who are able to help shape our projects in ways that, you know, if we just did, we, they wouldn't stand up. They wouldn't, you know. So it's so funny because I love my committee. I, I and also if, some pocket of the community doesn't understand or doesn't like or think they don't like something that's coming down the road, my committee members, as their peers, can go out and talk to them about what it is and say, so what is, what is it that bothers you about these lit sculptural elements you were going to have on this bridge here? And, you know, let's talk about this. And so it's so funny, but I, I couldn't survive without my public art committee. Yeah. And I, was, I don't want to diminish the contributions. Of no. Time. I was not a one-man show. No. Of the no, and I relied on the input from so many people, and we were very audience-focused. But, but it's different. But as you say, and, yeah. Yeah, you, that's the, yeah. the, the you amount didn't. of buy-in that's required right. is right. the stakes are very different. And with so. all the envelope pushing you were doing, it's ironic that you were not the one who was laid off. <laughs> <laughs> I, we both got laid off, not you. <laughs> no, I, I had an escape pod, Michael. <laughs> I saw, yeah. Andrea, could you talk a little bit about how you were... Um, your years as a high priestess influenced, <laughs> influenced, have influenced, or if they have influenced your, your <laughs> 10 years as a pimp for, for art, <laughs> to, you, to use your that's word. My, that's my tagline. That's my, that's tagline. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to make sure, I'm going to make sure pimp. that this does become, <laughs> there will be t-shirts with, you will have an option to pick one or the other. Uh, so, but here's, I think that, uh, cause I just had this discussion the other night with somebody about different ways that gallerists commercial gallerists operate, and some are very much curatorially inclined, and others are real business, business, business. I am definitely molded by my years at AAC and McLean Project for the Arts, and my interactions with artists and my friendships have really uh, guided my process and how I will work with somebody whose work I will be attracted to, also the personality, because when you're running a business with a, an artist, it's like, as somebody once said, it's like having a dysfunctional family, and you really want to make sure that you can get along with each artist in your stable, to use a kind of an old 80s term, but um, it's true. You need to have also that personal connection with somebody to make sure that you're both you know, working on the same page and moving forward, and it's all about getting the artist's work out there and sold and placed in public collections and good private collections. Um, so I have very much come at it like a curator, and I sometimes wish I had like the more greater business acumen and like really close the deal kind of mentality. I, I do that, but it's certainly not my driving impetus. Um, it's really my, I've been very dedicated to DC artists, but I also do show national and international artists. And uh, I really want the artists from this area to be 
curatorially contextualized with artists like, like Jeffrey um, on a global scale, because we're in a global world now. And this idea, when I was coming of age with all this, it was DC, it was very DC-centric, very regional, um, to the extent that it was somewhat ghettoized, you know, kind of navel-gazing, and everybody had the same shows, and everybody saw the same shows over and over again, the same artists, and I thought, okay, this has got to change. And um, so that's been my personal mission, to be able to bring the artists of the city into a more national and international sphere. Likewise, bringing those artists here from time to time to create a wonderful dialogue. Um, so uh, I, I, I don't know if I, I would have probably been a totally different dealer had I not had the experience here at AAC and McLean Project for the Arts, because I spent more time there. But um, it's, it's I, I feel like there are many different kinds of galleries, but those that are curator-led, I feel like I belong in that rubric, so. If, if I can, I mean, if I can sort of build off of that, you know, it's very interesting you know, going to MICA where a lot of what we talk about is, is community and sort of more socially based and public art, which was, has been in my first couple of years a real learning curve, but it's been very exciting. But the one thing that I, I definitely feel like AAC instilled in me and in sort of the nonprofit world uh, as represented by that experience instilled in me is that, you know, we do this work because we love artists. And you, you know, your job is you're going to give them the best showing and you're going to help them grow their work and you're going to help them develop and find an audience and connect to audiences and spaces and institutions that they don't know how to connect to. Um, so that's, that's the one thing that's definitely stayed with me is that feeling that that's, you, you were, we do this because we love artists, so. You, you, you just, you put your finger on it and you, you're echoing something that you, you said earlier in, an, uh, in, in one of your answers to a question. Um, several of you, in fact, all, th all three of you uh, sort of echoed this theme of the, uh, your, your kind of obsession with living artists. What, what are other people doing in their studios? Uh, one of you used the phrase mother's milk, this sense of like what living, what living artists are up to, what, what I'm doing in my studio, in your case, Jeffrey, what other people are doing in their studio. Um, you, you, Angela, you talked about uh, you know, just this sort of like, you know, discovering childhood curiosity yeah. about, you know, what other, what living artists are doing and why are they doing it. And, and um, let's talk a little bit about the role of the Arlington Art Center in um, fostering those, those people and, and uh, whether they're emerging mid career or late career. What, as each of you see it, is the role of the Arlington Art Center to uh, bring this work, the work of today's artists, to the people of Arlington and Washington? Uh, is, it, is it to, uh, should it be that focus on em mainly emerging artists or not? Uh, should it, is it becoming, uh, is it changing in the 40 years that the, that the center's been around? Has, is it evolving to become uh, more about art of social engagement, uh, issue-oriented art? Anyone who wants to jump in? and, and uh, grapple with that? Go ahead. Well, I always thought it was a wonderful place for emerging artists, and whenever artists would move to town or were just getting out of school, I would get calls or emails from them saying, I'm new to all this, where do I start? And I would always say, you know, well, a really great place to go to is the Arlington Arts. And of course, I had mentioned WPA and all the other nonprofits, but I said, AAC seems to have this real supportive fostering of young artists and their careers. And um, not to say that we didn't occasionally have some, you know, mid-career and, and even like old, older artists. Um, uh, one artist that down the street, Jason Horowitz, 20 years later, I'm still working with him. Um, but I was following his career and we maintained our relationship over those 20 years. Uh, I think it's fantastic for emerging artists, but Jeffrey really started to change the whole texture of the organization by bringing in very well known artists and, um, and, and kind of showing them with emerging artists, which I thought was very dynamic. So. Yeah, and again, just that, that, that feeling. In terms of the, the focus on emerging artists, I mean, you can do so much more with them, obviously. It's like you, you, can, you can bring in the art stars, but there's a sense in which they're not hungry and they're not ready to risk something. I mean, so in a, a show, you know, for example, well, Henry Thaggart and I did, did uh, uh, She's So Articulate about black women artists and narrative, and, you know, and we, can, we can go borrow a Faith Ringgold and take out a writer on our insurance and panic the entire time it's in the building, and we can, uh, uh, we can get some Renee Coxes, but that's the extent of it, and we can pay for Renee to come talk to people, but, but then to have younger artists who are excited to be part of that mix and then who we take them in a room and are like, what can we do? What, what, where can we go and have them create a completely new piece and it becomes a defining part of their portfolio. And for me, like you mentioned Jason Horowitz, um, 
it's a small thing, but uh, because he's right there, he introduced himself to me early on when I started working here, and we just started having lunch together, and I would go to his studio and see what he was working on, and we would just talk, and it was aimless talk, and I didn't know that Jason really wanted to show here, and he was, you know, he'd, 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 he'd been working for a while, and then, you know, it, it just came to a point where we just started saying, well, where are you going with this, and what could you, what would you like to do that you can't do now, and how could we make that a part of something we do here? So we decided that, you know, the whole point of Jason's work was scale, um, and this relationship to photography that's, that's about, you know, sort of taking photographs beyond their pixel resolution and this experience that has sort of painterly elements and photographic elements. He makes these very large, blown up, sort of alarming pieces of, of human anatomy and, and steak and dinners and drag queens. Um, and so we said, you know, shouldn't these be, you know, eight feet by 10 feet on the wall? So I ended up, you know, we, we sort of chewed on that for a while and eventually came up with a, an idea for a program, a show up about transhumanism and the transformation of the body through t technology. And I saw a way we could we could write a little piece of a, a grant proposal and get Jason some money to maybe do work that was bigger than anything he'd done before. And I felt like after that point, there was this, this shift between you know, the way he'd regarded his large body of work and his small body of work and what he was after with scale you know, before and after. And it was a little thing, but I felt like we, we figured something out as a result of, of working with him on that show. And that was, that was the sort of thing I wanted to be able to do in every show, is feel like, there was what you did before we started talking and, and had this marvelous scheme together, and there's what you do now. And maybe the difference is of degrees, but it's nonetheless, we've, we've figured something out, so. Yeah. One, one thing you just yeah. said, excuse me, um, no, no, about like, okay, so you bring Faith Ringgold here, or your writer, or whatever, and, and the emerging artists are very thrilled to be contextualized that way. But one thing I've talked to now, at great extent, because I have a lot of friends who are in their 70s and 80s now who are artists, they love being contextualized and being seen as relevant still with a younger generation. That's hugely important. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna get them into MoMA, but it keeps the dialogue about their work and, and puts it in another generation. And I think there's nothing more thrilling than an, to an artist in their 70s to have like 20-somethings absolutely to be like completely amazed by their work and try to do something that will like really, I don't know, accomplish a dialogue with that work. So I think it works both ways now. I think this, we were, we, for a while there, the art world was very ageist, I still think it is, but um, I am now seeing that older artists are getting a lot more respect because, let's face it, they've been at it for the longest, and this whole kind of hedge fund mentality of IPA young artists is thankfully going away. But when you said that, I just wanted to, like, from the younger and older artists I talk to all the time, like, how important it is to have that kind of connection with each other? So, well, I, would, I, I don't know if I'm going to address this issue of, of the role of the Arlington Art Center because I think I still don't quite understand how it fits into the whole ecology of, of art centers. I think when I started, there seemed to have been kind of a, a, a ladder, where, so to speak, of folks who maybe got their start here and then would go to maybe an ICA like the Washington Project for the Arts, which at the time had four or five curators on staff and its own building, and, um, and then would some of them find their way to museums and do direction shows, say, at the Hirshhorn and that kind of thing. Um, and, and I don't know if that really exists anymore. I mean, there's the art fairs, there's all these quasi, uh, you know, as you say, sort of business and, and curatorial, the blending has gotten, um, I think, indistinct in some cases, and not bad, actually, and I know nonprofits are looking at models that maybe are for-profit in some cases, and so everything's changing, but um, one of the things that I learned here, and certainly in my aha, realizing that artists are, are, are living, and I used to say you can't party with a dead artist, so that was my big coming out. <laughs> coming out with these are these people are fun there's so much fun so um anyway i uh but i but i got to understand what artists could do and often setting up their own problems to solve which you know i think people do in their solo pursuits and i have been able to translate that i think because of my curatorial background and here especially to problems of civic design that exist out in, in Arlington. So knowing, thanks to Nancy Holt, who was far ahead of me, and I can't, no credit for her other than having remodeled, working with her to renovate her park, but um, she really set the, um, the bar, as I told her, high for us in that she was an artist-led 
uh, not only design team, but she, she hired all the subs that built that park. So she was initially hired just to do a object in the park. And she said, no, let me design the whole park. And then that rang true for me because of what I knew, what I learned from working with artists here, that artists really can solve problems and take the lead and, and come up with ideas for huge endeavors that are unique to what other folks would come at through these co typical committee meetings and lots of engineers and not a lot of, frankly, a lot of creative people in the room. So it, it allowed me to push in the 15 years I've led this program to getting artists to lead the solution, lead the, the design of our civic facilities. And there's a lot of pushback on that, but we still fight the good fight. Um, and that's what I learned here. Well, th that I, I'm interested in that idea of, of what artists can do, what artists, as you said, what artists could do. And I, I, it seems related to the, uh, another question of uh, what artists should do. And since this, uh, this is called social studies, and there is this, which to me suggests that we want to at least talk a little bit about um, the, the idea of social engagement and political art. How is, wh what are some of the issues that artists were dealing with 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, and what are they dealing with today? How is that changing? I mean, some of, some of this is changing um, simply because curators are, as, as Jeffrey said, sort of pushing the conversation, as you're pushing some of your students in, you know, in, in a certain direction. But, uh, but maybe some of it is also that uh, artists are interested in different things. And, and I'd like to explore that a little bit. Um, you know, you, Jeffrey, you were very recently a curator here, but you've been, you've, you've been paying attention to, to art and artists and uh, the ideas that they're expressing and grappling with and the, and the changes that they're um, advocating for in some cases or, or, or ideas that they're bringing up. What, how, how have those ideas grown and evolved and how has, how has Arlington's appetite for them uh, kept up with that? Um, okay. Uh, in terms of, yeah. Um, well, I mean, in terms of, you know, artists and social engagement, I mean, I think, I think the thing that has changed, and again, you know, it hasn't been that many years since I left, but uh, the thing that I'm, I'm really aware of is, is, is how problematic it is. It, it's, it's not such a simple thing to simply take an artist and have them parachute into a community and solve a problem and leave. Um, and there is an entire curatorial industry sort of built around placemaking and the ideas of, of events or fairs that, that draw attention to the history of a place or address social issues and artists come from elsewhere and something happens and then it's over. And I think in the past few years, five, six, seven years, decade, we've really become aware of how problematic that is. And just, and, it, and it's, there, there are no easy answers. It's not just that if you want an artist to work with a local community that they have to live in the community or be a resident, because even then there's this sort of essentializing problem. It's like, well, of course you are the person who should represent them because you live here, and that's not quite it either. Um, I mean, art is not social work. I mean, art is a sort of an unfettered thinking about how we could challenge the order, but I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, Rick Lowe and Project Row House, he just won, won the MacArthur, the MacArthur right? and that is a, a, a brilliant project in Texas where he's providing housing for people. It's a real, you know, it's, it, there are real world consequences. And yet, if you evaluated Project Row House as, you know, a housing project, it's a total failure. It's, it's, it's a fabulous art project. It does things that no art project you would expect to do, but as housing, not so much. Um, it does and it doesn't. So in terms of, you know, how, how has, I, I, I think, you know, artists um, are, eager to try to, to, to engage with sort of community art. Even my experiences with students, we bring lots of artists who don't identify as community artists, mm -hmm. have traditional studio practices, and are hungry to make sense of where they live and how the environment around them is changing. And that's exciting, but I also think we, we, we increasingly see how, how tricky a proposition that is. Um, as for how it's changed in Arlington, I mean, I'm, I live in DC and I have a wake up call every six months when I drive into Arlington. So I feel like even from when I've worked here, it's in some ways unrecognizable. So I don't know if I have the, the, my finger on the pulse of that as much as maybe say Angela would or. Unrecognizable in, in, in what way? Just our, uh, in terms of uh, 
gentrification or what? Well, or? I mean, sir, yeah, well, just, I mean, in a very physical way in terms of that, that building, I don't remember, and these, <laughs> all these people who now live here, and what, what is that? So um, I, I did live in Arlington in the, uh, in the late 90s, and there were, you know, large fields that I walked through that are now, you know, developments on top of developments. So, and even in the years since, you know, I, I left here, in the last, you know, three, four years, it's a lot has just rapidly changed. Um, and you certainly see that everywhere, but you know, Baltimore is where I spend most of my time now is very different because for rapid gentrification to happen, people have to want to live there. And um, <laughs> while, you know, while either there, you know, Baltimore, there is Penn Station and there's, there's certainly there are reasons for people to want to, to live in the arts district and, and, and there are lots of amenities in Baltimore. Nonetheless, there's also plenty of vacancy and rundown properties and, and everyone's still watching reruns of The Wire. So um, <laughs> it's a much s slower, stranger process. So. I think when I was here, we also did some um, artists in the community projects and, you know, it was really a learn as you go. Um, Maria Teresa Fernandez, was an artist from Baltimore, and um, I had a grant to put her, in, in, I asked her what she wanted to do, and she really wanted to work with, with um, women who had been domestically uh, abused and were like basically in a shelter, trying to hide from their husbands or boyfriends or whoever had abused them. And you know the do-goodism of the project was really noble, but the reality was that it was almost an impossible project to do because you know, she would go there twice a week and I'd go with her and she'd start these projects that was textile based and, and like basically telling your stories through embroidery and knitting and crocheting and, and Maria Teresa was this awesome, wonderful woman. But what we realized is these women were very transient, you know, because they were always moving, they were afraid that they, they were always being followed and they were going from shelter to shelter and so the project really didn't have a good resolution because the, the people that we were working with were constantly changing and hiding and so the ultimate kind of final little show that we did was, to me, like as a curator, a bit of a disappointment, um, only because I realized we were kind of like trying to be these do-gooders and really not knowing what we were getting into. So in that regard, I think Arlington Arts Center was great for letting us experiment and, like, and have the option, or the ability rather, to fail and see why that particular project didn't really work out. You know, nonetheless, it was a great, you know, Maria Teresa became good friends with some of these people and, you know, I had this wonderful relationship with her, but you know, there are times that public projects, art, you know, social situations, are, it's going to fail. Interestingly enough, one of the greatest degrees right now is a social practices degree in, 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 on the graduate level. This seems to be, you know, ever since um, Rirkrit, uh, whose surname I can never pronounce, Travanajaya, whatever, just, you know, he fed people soup and the Thai guy. <laughs> he fed people soup as his practice, and I think he really laid open in 1991, he did that to this whole like enthusiasm for uh, social practices in the arts and now like I can't believe how many degree programs there are around the country. Can, can I just say one thing? I, I was thinking in terms of sort of public engagement, I always think of, of programs and like at AAC, like in terms of public art projects while I was here, I can only think of a few smaller things, but we were always very aware that you were, were trying to build programming into every show and what are the opportunities here that we're gonna build a class around this? What are the opportunities for, to bring different constituencies in and in terms of the idea of sort of failing in public, it's like sometimes you would hit a home run and you would touch a nerve and you would have a full house to discuss some issue and other times you have six people. But you still have to deliver in front of those six people. But that was, that was part of that trying to find, well, who, who, who are we talking to and how do we bring them here? And it was always, you know, trying to keep a full plate. You didn't always have a full house, so. Um, so I just want to answer your question. So uh, um, homelessness still mm -hmm. were, was an issue we were dealing with, um, AIDS. Uh, uh, gender, those were things that our thematic shows dealt with uh, when we were here, uh, when I was here. And then I went to the Women's Museum to do a community-based exhibition called Artists Plus Community. And I just want to say I learned everything I needed to know about good community-based practice in the arts from Judy Byron, who's here in the audience tonight, who, like Rick Lowe, has completely walked the talk. She lives where she works, she makes art, she creates community through her work. She has taught people to be artists and nurtured them along. We went to the Corcoran and actually sold our idea to then Sammy Hoy, who's now your dean, um, president, uh, to create this, uh, use the, the resources of the Corcoran to create this mentorship program, which won an NEA grant and numerous awards. So. You know, I think 
The thing that interests me when this job became available in Arlington was instead of running around and finding the social service groups that needed artists and doing that sort of matchmaking, all of those resources were at my fingertips here coming to the county. And that's what made me the most excited coming here. And it's a challenge, I think, to continue to do that work. My colleague Eliza worked on, has working on a project bringing Foon, who was here a minute ago, there he is, to um, a, a program where um, kids who are kind of at their last stop for trying to get their GED, they, uh, it's sort of an alternative high school program called New Directions. And the principal came to an opening, we commissioned some black and white photographs for the county manager's office, all done by high school students, and he came and we started talking. and we said, great, well, let's do something. And so that's, you know, with my 3,000 colleagues all working across different disciplines and many of them in social service, um, we've been able to do these types of partnerships, one-offs and um, projects. And so that's what I love about working here. And um, social practice is always in our thinking, I think, as a result of where we work. As someone who's been with the county for 20 years um, in different capacities, you can, you can probably also address the question of uh, why Arlington has such a strong commitment, or appears to have such a strong commitment to, to art. Um, you know, it, it, these, you said the resources, one of the great things was the resources were already there. I mean, why, were, why, do, they prov why do they make a point of providing the resources in, in 98 or whenever it was when they won this innovation, innovations award, it was, it was not so much for visual art, but providing resources for um, theater groups, uh, dance troops, uh, musical uh, gr groups. I mean, it was really this, like, just across, this, across the board commitment and investment of uh, money and resources to, to the arts that you don't see in a lot of other jurisdictions, uh, you know, Washington included. I mean, you know, Washington, it's great that what Washington is doing right now with, you know, the, the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities with the five by five, you know, but then there have been some somewhat more uh, controversial uh, projects like the, you know, party animals or, you know, the painted sculptures which have generated, you know, some mixed feelings. Um, why, you know, what what is it about Arlington that uh, has created this incubator for for the arts. I mean, from your vision, perspective, vision. I mean, Kathy Freshly, whose name has been mentioned, certainly was the vision behind this space. Uh, this space, uh, this program, has always nurtured artists, and she instilled this idea of there being a term limit to that incubation. And she was able to start, uh, help start a group of artists start a. Um, studio program on Columbia Pike um, and then a program at the Unitarian Church. So there's been this commitment to a sense of having art pretty much throughout our community. Norma Kaplan, who was our division chief for 26 years and who was behind the, the Alberto Gaetan project you mentioned among others and really guided us to a public art policy and supported this group, this uh, uh, building and the capital campaign that eventually built this out in a tremendous way, she she had tremendous vision for for what you know Arlington could be. Um, she was the idea had the idea to do Artisphere, and I think that's actually where her ability to do guerrilla projects, as you mentioned, in a good way and sort of work under the radar when things started to come up underground. And she wasn't quite the right leader for that type of effort. So. Um, but I do think it's been a series of people who have had strong vision, our public art committee, our arts commission, still people who push hard. We're going to be hiring a new chief of cultural affairs and hoping that that person will bring the next level of vision to uh, the community. But I think it's, it's existed here in, in myriad forms for decades, a vision that art should be throughout this community, infused, public, private. Our bids, our business improvement districts, all have art as part of their programming. It's just part of who we are, actually, which was a slogan we had back in that, the day when we won that innovations award. Is part of it, is part of it the audience, the uh, <clears throat> proximity to Washington, 
and its cultural centers, the, uh, uh, the population uh, the, the tends to be well-educated, uh, discretionary income, uh, cultural sophistication. I mean, is that, is that, uh, is, is part of it that uh, an, a hunger is being fed by, by the county? Um, and, 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 and conversely, I mean, is the, is the, does the, is the audience, uh, is the audience being sort of grown or cultivated and educated by the food they're getting, the, the, the cultural food that they're consuming? I mean, it seems like it's a two-way street. I, I think so. I mean, I'd, I'd be curious, actually, to what others think about this. I don't know if it's appropriate to ask other people. But I know that there are plenty of people who live and work here in Arlington and have had long experiences. You throw it, yeah. throw it open to questions or, or, or even answers from the You know, audience. there's a mic, if you don't mind, Anne. Well, it's just to get you on for posterity. Yeah. So <laughs> it's not to amplify you. Thank you. Well, I've lived in Arlington for more years than I care to tell you. And I've been associated with the Arlington Arts Center for since its beginning. And I have to say, I feel that the Arts Center led the way. I don't think the audience led the way. I think we have educated and made Arlington a place where people want to live. I don't think that 40 years ago, I don't think the audience and the citizenry of Arlington created the need for the art center. I think the Arlington Art Center came to them, if that answers your question at all. Nicely. Thank you. Anyone else? I think, yeah, Lucy. Lucy, you must use the mic, though. <laughs> Thanks, Stephanie. <clears throat> <laughs> I'm the other gray-haired person here. She's <laughs> been here a long, long time. I, I agree with Anne, but I think that the population of Arlington has always wanted art. I think it's very diverse people. We had the Freedmen's Village here after the Civil War, and so diversity is part of what Arlington has always been. We had the Vietnamese come in, we've had the Latinos come in, and we just embrace diversity, and the diversity produces art, and we like it. And don't forget, politically, Arlington has been democratic for a very long time, not to be mentioning politics, but it does vote a particular way. And the bonds get voted in for innovative things like the public art program and school diversity like HB and so forth like that. It's just who we are. We like it that way, and we want to keep it that way. And um, I've been here, I think it's longer, longer than, than Anne has. So uh, <laughs> let's keep it going. I have to say, it was a bit of a culture shock when I went from Arlington to uh, County, to Fairfax County, where um, here I felt like I could get away with almost anything. And in Fairfax County, ooh, not at all. I mean, I couldn't show nudity, I had political issues. Oh, I had always had to come up to the building I was in to explain to the staff why we were showing what we were showing, and oh, what if somebody gets offended? I said, well then, good, you know, I'm happy to like take them by the hand and give them a private lecture. I am on call, that's my job. Uh, but they were so afraid of offending anybody in Fairfax, it was just, whew pretty difficult. So, you know, basically you mined a territory that kind of went deep with the parameters you were given, but I felt like it was two totally different experiences of Northern Virginia. Um. Jeffrey, uh, it, since you are uh, uh, in academia now, <clears throat> we've talked about, you know, maybe how, um, Angela, you, you, you spoke of how, you know, some, some of the issues have changed and stayed the same over the years. Um, that artists are dealing with, but I'm, I'm curious also about some of the ideas that tomorrow's, um, tomorrow's curators, who are your students today, are, are, are dealing with, or maybe that you are pushing them to deal with. I mean, 10 years from now, at uh, the Arlington Art Center's 50th anniversary, who will, what, what sort of curatorial directions will we have seen in that, if you care to make a prediction about uh, <laughs> Since you mold, you have a generation in your hands that you are molding. I'm to mold towards something. Um, 
I mean, in terms of uh, well, in terms of our program specifically, I mean, we're, we're we th think very cross discipline. It's a deliberately cross disciplinary program. I mean, we bring in we have people who previous in previous lives were scientists who are coming to work with us, and you know, it's an MFA program. It's not an MA. You know, we're not training people to be art historians necessarily working in a museum. Some people will work in museums. But um, I came to this via an unconventional path. And um, I think we're, we're trying to train a generation of curators to be flexible, to be flexible problem solvers who think of an audience first um, and really uh, are, are trying to catalyze change. And one of the goals um, in the program that I inherited from George Sissel, who I keep seeing one of his very early shows, I keep very happy to keep seeing it flash on the uh, 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 screen there. Um, for one of the sort of the goals of EDS is always when we can partner with an institution in Baltimore to sort of ask them to do something that's a little larger than they would ordinarily do. I mean, this is something that George made a career of um, uh, with, with Mining the Museum and Fred Wilson, the seminal show where he, I think the, the most highly attended show that the museum ever had, and he invited an artist to come in and sort of confront the legacy of racism and slavery in Maryland by rearranging their collection in intuitive and uh, curious ways. Um, so often, you know, we're trying to partner our students with institutions that aren't ready for the questions the students are going to ask. Um, I, you know, I have so much relied on, you know, what uh, Andrea said when, when I was here that I, I never felt like I was going to get into trouble. There were things we were worried about in terms of kids. We were going to have families and, and multiple generations here, and I wanted to know, I wanted to feel like we had a good reason for whatever we were showing, and we had a good strategy for if there were something that we felt like we had to show, something that was about sexual identity or violence or race, and we felt like this, this needs to be seen and people need to have this conversation, but you know, we're gonna have little kids doing finger painting downstairs. Like how, how do these, you know, other than not going by that room on the tour, how do we do that? But I never really felt like I had to, to step back and, and water down what we were going to do. I, I always felt like there was, there was something about the community, something about, you know, I, I, I spoke lightly of not having to go to the board with things, but there was always tremendous support for that, that feeling that we can, we can tackle tough subjects and we can say things that people, other, some, somewhere else people might be uncomfortable with, um, but we can address them. So in terms of what I want my students to do, I want them to feel comfortable to take issues head on, to think of their audience first, to think collaboratively, and to try to challenge institutions to, to accelerate and move forward and do new things. Um, and one of the most rewarding things since I've been there is I'm on, now on the board and I'm the head of the program committee for the Contemporary, which is the institution that uh, George founded, which is a museum without a home. It's a nomadic museum. Um, and our mission statement, which is very short, one of the sentences is audience is everywhere. And we don't have a building. We, we, we go to our audience and we are nimble problem solvers, you know, always rethinking our mission based on the project, the artist, and the space. And while AAC is a gorgeous space, it can also be a place that can serve as a catalyst for the area and can bring people in to think deeply about issues beyond these walls and what's happening you know, right here. So, How, how did, um, in your tenure, how did you or the center handle um, issues of taste or propriety in, in light of the fact that there are kids doing finger painting downstairs or maybe school groups that would be wandering into a show with uh, some difficult or challenging subject matter, and 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 Andrea, maybe you could tell how uh, how McLean handled it or didn't handle it. I mean, perhaps if if they handled it by, you know, uh, by saying that you couldn't show something like that, uh, I would I'd be interested in knowing that. I mean, it seems like all arts organizations have to wrestle with this. I mean, the Her the Hirshhorn, the Corcoran, they've had you know put up a label that said the show may contain show that's inappropriate for children, um, even. Uh, Jason's show at, at Studio 1469, I think there were some pieces that maybe had to come down when, when, when the gallery <laughs> was closed. Had to be covered up when the gallery was closed because, because of people in the neighborhood could look in through the window. And oh, there it was were the classes that they had in there. Oh, there were the classes, classes okay. In there. And that's what we so, did at McLean. Um, for the one thing, and here is my own kind of own disconnect, is I've always been comfortable with nudity and art, you know, with the Kenneth Clark models. So, I was surprised when I had uh, one artist um, doing a series of nude photographs. I mean, they were not, they were kind of portrait, they were not remotely erotic, but you know, the powers that be in, in McLean decided that they had to be covered up when classes were in the gallery. For a long time, classes were in the gallery, which always made me uncomfortable, more for damage and insurance and liability issues. Eventually, they raised enough money to build an art studio 
downstairs and that problem was resolved. But um, yeah, we had to cover things up, which I always felt, you know, having been involved with Maplethorpe and the Jesse Helms debates was really like, kind of made me kind of pissed off, but you know. Were you, were you ever told you couldn't show something? No, I was never told that. I was once had a very kind of crazy show where I had a Kiki Smith scarf that had, you know, very 13th century Arabic kind of writing on it. And next to it, for graphic reasons, I had a print by a uh, Puerto Rican artist who had a short head of a terrorist. And this was all along this very graphic wall of prints and, and multiples, and the whole show had about 200 pieces. But some person got very offended that I was drawing a conclusion that all Muslims are terrorists. By, she made that assumption. And, you know, and I had to take her around the gallery and tell her what the whole impetus for the show was. And, and that was a big to-do. I didn't realize it was such a big to-do. Um, but you know, that was something that I realized as a curator, that's, that's what you have to do. You have to take that responsibility and realize that people are going to misinterpret your intentions um, and be open to the dialogue. Uh, sometimes it could be dangerous because you know, the Virginia Commission was always like, oh, we don't need any like, things that could possibly shut us down. You know, and there was always that nervousness. But I think it's just a matter of communicating, you know, getting on the phone to people and saying, here's what the situation is. Here's why you're hearing from said you know, constituent in Virginia and why they don't want you to fund McLean Project for the Arts anymore. This is one person. You know, and so it was just the dialogue. You really have to be in open communication. And Jeffrey, so, how, how was it handled during your tenure? If there were issues, ever issues or, or, uh, of taste or sensitive subject matter? I mean, I usually feel like we had images that were sort of, uh, I, I, I guess I would say as, as a general strategy, when I first came here and, and didn't know what I was doing, um, I really felt like we're not going to clutter this space up with wall text and we'll use you know, map pin, numbered map pins and we'll be very sleek. And that's, I think, you know, one of the responsibilities of a space like this where you're trying to bring in you know, different audiences and not necessarily a museum going public all the time and you have uh, educational programming is your, your job as a curator is to provide as much information as someone who is curious or has questions could possibly want. Not in a way that's necessarily didactic or that is, is overly just sort of explaining or interpreting the art, but, it, but if people need information, you give it to them. So my feeling was like if you can, you know, flag work as, as being, you know, this, this may not be appropriate for children, maybe we have to put it downstairs in the experimental galleries so that we know if we have a, 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 a student group coming in um, that there's a room we won't go to. Um, but otherwise, like as long as you are setting up that conversation, as long as you are talking people through it, and as long as you are giving them all of the information that they, they need or, or could possibly want to deal with that, uh, I, I feel like there shouldn't be a problem. And maybe, again, this question of Arlington and, and these questions you're asking about drawing on an educated audience or this, this feeling of sort of civic responsibility and a championing of art allows us to do that more openly than somewhere else, but I, I always felt as long as you engage the conversation, you provide information, and, and we'll all hold hands and skip through this, so. I mean, it's, yeah, go ahead. Well, the only thing I want to add is that, um, is making me remember that uh, when Norma Kaplan was successful in establishing an arts commission here, um, I think around 1990, the, she had the county board approve uh, an arts support spot policy that explicitly forbade uh, any, uh, well, encourage freedom of expression, but forbade censorship. So, so it, it, and I think it came from, as Lucy explained, and Anne explained, I think it came from the tolerances she knew this community had for that, but she actually put pen to paper and got our elected officials to say, we will not censor. Um, and we have done more in the performing arts, but um, all kinds of crazy things. Puppetry of the penis, does anyone remember that? But um, anyway, I mean, seriously. But, but it would, she would, and so she would challenge it. She would, she'd, she'd remind folks that they had signed this and, and I think would push it in her own way. Well, that was, um, actually, that was yeah. actually in our exhibition policy exactly. for our members. We exactly. had a form and a folder that exactly. said that we do, yeah, we do not censor our yeah. work and we don't believe in censorship. And so. as a supported group, Arlington Arts Center then had the cover of the larger art support policy that the Arts Commission supported. Right. So you had it at a couple levels. Yeah. All of which suggests that, that uh, <clears throat> Arlington and the Arlington Arts Center and Arlington Public Art aren't necessarily simply engaging in the conversation, but really leading the conversation the, the way uh, two of our, our audience members who spoke suggested that this really is um, Arlington 
Arlington in the lead and, and the audience kind of playing catch up or, or coming along with the, you know, entering the conversation at the invitation of the county. Um, and so I, I'd like to, um, I'd like to at this point ask one, one final question and maybe open it up to questions from the audience uh, in our last 15 minutes or so. Uh, the question I want to throw out to each of you is to, is to uh, give me one or two examples of um, a show or shows that have, uh, and they can be shows that you had a hand in creating or, that, or not, or either shows that you have seen as, as a consumer or as a creator. Um, that have that, that sort of illuminate or illustrate some of these ideas we've been talking about, and uh, particularly the, idea, the particularly the idea of um, advancing the conversation, sort of leading leading the charge. Uh, shows that have uh, of which you have been proud to uh, to make or or proud to have witnessed in uh, during your tenure, after your tenure, or before your tenure. Let's maybe start with Jeffrey and then move move back down this way. <laughs> Unless you're still thinking. Oh no no no! I, somebody, um, somebody else who has an idea <laughs> can maybe speak if you if you're not ready. I mean, I could say you know the, the, there were a couple of a couple of shows. I mentioned the show that I did with Henry Thaggart, and that was early. Like I, as Andrea was saying, you arrive here and you inherit a certain amount of programming, and you work through that, and then you get to the stuff that you get to do. And I, I think that she's so articulate might have been that first show where we curated it mm -hmm. together, and it was. We did it in three months. Like we really, we it was irresponsible how fast we put that show together, um, and uh, um, and it was a sh again a show of black women artists, and you know where one of the curators is white, and right away there's the issue of you know doing an identity specific show in this day and age um, is immediately problematic. Um, I think you know, and, and in our minds was you know this is this is. A regional art center. Um, um, this is not the Whitney, and there's there's a way in which this is still necessary, and there's there's a, there's a, something that we still need to address. And a lot of the artists had to be brought along. You know, we had to have long conversations about what it meant that we were doing this show, what it meant that 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 black women artists was in the title. Um, we got shot down by some people. Adrienne Piper, you know, has her stock response. I will not be in show. I, I do not want to be referred to as a woman artist. I do not want to be referred to as a black artist. I do not want to be referred to as a black woman artist. And um, and I understand. So so there were a lot of tough conversations with the artists. And then we did the show, and I just remember it being immensely rewarding, just because so many people after we had to have all of these tense conversations about why the show was necessary, what it meant that it was an all black contemporary artist show. And so many people were just so thrilled to have these artists championed, to have this mix of, of national artists and then people working in the region that we're trying to, to, to put together. Um, that was just immensely gratifying. I felt like after all of that tension that so many people were so thrilled, thrilled by the result in the conversation. Um, the second show that I, I was involved in that I was very proud of was Transhuman Conditions, and that was mostly because that was the first show where we'd, we'd uh, you know, written this grant and we'd gotten to do these things. We could think big and actually execute them. And, the, and it, the, 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 I, the, the concept of the show was really just an umbrella to bring in all sorts of things I wanted to talk about. From uh, Ivan Lozano had this piece about, uh, about sort of sexual identity and sort of finding your way as, as a young gay man when everything you learn about sexuality is via the internet. And you know, so it would became this cover to bring in all of these, these sub-conversations. Uh, um, and and that, was, that was very rewarding. And then finally, thinking about public art and, and sort of social art, when, when you know, Jennifer made this happen, bringing Mel Chin here and having that conversation, um, and you know, having, the fun, having this place be a collection site for the Fundred Project. And I don't know how many people, if everyone in the room knows the Fundred Project, but um, it was a project that the output was, was meant to uh, um, fund this process that would lessen the amount of lead in the soil in, in, in impoverished areas in New Orleans. But there's people, children who are suffering from lead poisoning um, in certain, certain impoverished districts. Um, and there was this very simple protocol where you could essentially till phosphates into the soil and they would bond with the lead and you would, there would be an immediate outcome. And there was a scientist who needed $300 million at Tulane to do this. And Mel Chin said, well, I can't get $300 million, but I can make it. So he wanted school children across the country to draw $300 million. So they did all these workshops in schools. Schools would draw their own $100 bills. And then a vegetable oil powered uh, armored car would pick up all of the money and take it to Congress and exchange it for the real thing. Um, 
I don't think that the project ever really resolved the way it was supposed to. There were countless collection centers. We were one of them. Uh, a, a great deal of funded money was raised. The truck came here. We, we, the staff of the Arlington Arts Center put on our caps and had our, our shovel guns and presented our, our palette of, of fundreds. Um, but it was really just fascinating to be able to spend time with Mel, to have people come here and talk about these very serious social issues and what art can do, and then to even get to follow him as he walked around Capitol Hill and went, went to Senator Landry's office. And the strange disconnect when you bring an artist to a senator's office. And <laughs> you, there, there kept being a moment in the conversation where everyone saw the efficacy of what was being proposed, that this is a thing we can do and it will have a real impact. But we kept getting hung up on you want to exchange a pallet full of fake money for real money. <laughs> and, and, and the people kept saying, but do you have someone working on language for this? And we didn't understand what they were saying. And afterwards, my wife, who works in politics, we went to dinner and she said, they're asking you to write an earmark. And he's like, well, why would I want to do that? She's like, they're telling you they're going to give you $300 million. <laughs> and that to me was, was you know, the, the sense in which, yes, you could write the earmark, you could get the $300 million and you could do it. But then there was, you know, hundreds of thousands of school children and this entire process and this entire narrative that, that, that everyone can, can be touched by and think about, that's, it's a different thing. It's not, maybe it doesn't have the efficacy, but there's, there's a different way in which everyone can, can own that and talk about that and participate in it that I think is, is, is meaningful in a totally different way, so. Andrea, do you have something you want to, a horn you want to toot? Uh, well, actually, I think, Angela, you were involved in this project. Remember Catfish Dreaming? Mm -hmm. That was Allison and Betty Sarr, and the truck went around town. It was in numerous art spaces, as well as schools. And it was this big catfish on this kind of pickup truck, and it was all about storytelling. And, um, you know, you're making me dig back way into my gray cells here. <laughs> it was like 20-some years ago. But I remember that being a hugely successful project, and I, you were very involved in that, too. Well, it was another George Thistle project. Okay, it was a George mm -hmm. Thistle project. Contemporary, yep. yep. And, I remember just mm -hmm. like the audience we had here at the Art Center for that weekend that, that um, the truck was here. Um, just uh, that level of excitement, because uh, storytelling is really where that's the most human kind of thing that we can do with each other is telling each other stories. And it was very much about people relaying their stories of their childhood, their memories. Um, it's about catfish or fishing or, you know, southern kind of experiences. So it was quite moving. Um, the second show that I was involved in, remember I was only here one year and I was just all inherited programming, but I really did enjoy working with Marianne Crow, the, the zine show that we did all about, it was called um, Collateral Damage. It was all about guns, you know, very timely. We could do the show again today. And it was um, zines and email, uh, excuse me, not email. Um, this was way before email. Oh my God, I'm so old. <laughs> it was mail art and zines. Um, and we had thousands of submissions to the Art Center from all over the world. It was so cool. It was very guerrilla and very kind of punk rock. And we just filled the whole, like all the galleries with this show. And I think, you know, from both military to gang violence to, you know, domestic abuse type of violence situations, it was, you know, a pretty provocative exhibition, very moving. And we had a lot of people, we got a lot of press on that show. We had a lot of people come to see that exhibition. So that was quite gratifying. The next panel discussion that you're invited to, you can come back and you can explain to the youngsters what male art is. <laughs> um, Angela, do you have anything you'd like well, to mention? Well, you know, I, this may be a, a bit of a, a generalization, but I, I do think that my experience now, what I feel, and to a certain extent, curating the county through our public art program, um, what I've been able to learn has been how a city works and everything from urban design to really all the different aspects and now in economic development, the funding base, the tax base. And so I feel like working, the, the privilege I've had working with artists in all the different applications throughout uh, the projects I've been able to do through Arlington Public Art has really taught me how cities operate and what the role arts and artists can have in making great cities. And I think, you know, everything we read, cities are the future. Uh, these cities are going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and we're going to become more urbanly defined. And, and what I think the levels of what makes uh, being urban tolerable. Uh, I think we're going to be looking to art for solutions for that. And I think artists are leading the way in helping us imagine cities. And so I feel like I'm continuing to learn so much through the work that I do with the artists that I've been gifted to work with. Cities are works of art. Uh, do we have time for questions? 
there's this running theme that some of the more successful projects have been more participatory. Do you feel like that is something that has a tendency to run across art in any venue or that is so heightened in this particular community art center? Well, we're going to take on a participatory project. I'll just mention, we haven't done a lot of our own sponsoring of temporary public art because we've been focused on some of these larger projects. But as the community is envisioning Courthouse and what it wants for the future government center in Courthouse, um, there's been a whole participation process this year that we're going to continue in subsequent years through engagement, civic engagement, and that will be all artist-led in its gestures. So some kind of quick one-off engaging projects that um, will happen on site to, we'll be commissioning artists to think about what Arlington is, but continuing to engage Arlingtonians to tell us what Arlington means to them and what civic engagement means to them that's particular to Arlington. So we're about to launch those for, for Courthouse. Um, so we're about to take this engagement, I think, a little bit further than what we've been doing in recent years. And if, oh, well, I, was say, I think just more generally, in terms of thinking of, of sort of the, the non, I mean, there are, there are nonprofit art centers uh, um, in cities everywhere. I think of School 33 in Baltimore. and, and um, I think, you know, in terms of what, what you're, Artists apply for shows at, at these nonprofits, sometimes seeing them as a way to get a foot in the door in terms of their professional development or as sort of a starting step. But I think the art, the art center, the job of the art center and our job here was always to ask, you know, why do you want to do this here? Why do you want to bring this here? And how are you going to talk to our people? So right out of the gate, that's you're asking these questions about, oh, fine, I see what you're proposing, but, but why is, what's, what's the value here? Not that you have to be a service provider, but that there's something that you're going to bring to us that allows us to have that conversation. And I think that's different from, obviously, from commercial gallery culture. Um, but I think also just even in the culture of the institution, I know like in our, uh, our um, I don't know what the process looks like now, but with the, uh, the, the resident artist studios, I know in the application, there's a whole section about community service and what does that look like? So that's a question that's always sort of being asked in there as a part of the the mix of what matters to, to this building, so. I was gonna address that from a gallery standpoint. Clearly it's a little bit more difficult, but not impossible to have the participatory in a commercial gallery setting. You know, the bottom line is that you're always trying to monetize something so that you can keep the rent paid and uh, keep going. Um, one gallery that doesn't need the money just had the big Oscar Murillo show in New York at David Zwerner where it was very participatory and then people got their chocolate as they left, you know, the candy factory that Oscar Murillo, who's known for his paintings and he's getting exorbitant sums for his paintings, he's only 28, but he really wanted to use that commercial gallery setting as a, to show his history and where his parents came from in Colombia in the factory and created a factory for candy and let everybody come in and take free candy away. Now, Zwerner is a very well-funded gallery, so they can get away with that from time to time. Um, so, but I, I would say, you know, for a small gallery like mine, while I'm very intrigued by that type of kind of shows, and where I can, I will try to do something more participatory, it's a little hard to keep, you know, the rent paid that way, so. Any other questions? Uh, I just want to come here to say thank you. Uh, not a question, just want to thank all of you here that curators for Arlington Art Center for all these years been curating exhibitions and for all the artists who want to show work that are not allowed to show elsewhere. That's the most important part, that, that work that, that may not be sold, that some people would not want to, to, to show because they cannot sell it. And uh, for work that artists have, you know, to want to show work that are too large that somebody else do not want to support or do not provide the space. So this is just not the most wonderful thing that you guys, the Art Center has helped emerging young artists to artists who are already established as well. So I think just want to say thank you. And remember, Andrea, we have to put two feet of mulch up on the ground <laughs> to satisfy the Art Arlington <laughs> County's request that for the safety of the 20-foot sculpture we put up, we have to put two feet of mulch up, which I totally disagree. But I know, oh my God, it was so dramatic disagree, with But for the safety of the, of, the, of, the, of the public, we have to do that. So, but all that, one thing I want to come down to, it's not just the financial help they gave us, you gave us, but it's the heart of the people of the Art Center in Arlington as well to support artists. And I agree with Angela, you know, 
Kathy Freshway has the, has the vision that art is important in this county. They provide studio, including my studio, that, that helped me when, when I was young, I need help, can't afford high rent, and they provide a space for me to work. Even though I provide, end up having too much sawdust, two inches of sawdust, that the <laughs> fire marshal have to shut me down. But, uh, <laughs> but still, you know, the Artlands, Arlington Art Center did not reject me. It's the fire department. <laughs> So they are still on my side. The art center, <laughs> always on the artist side. Just want to say thank you again. Just keep continue to continue to provide the space and and the, the what they call the, the breeding ground, the, the, the you know the nurturing the site for many artists to come. And I will, I've been sending students of mine to come here to continue to get exhibition opportunity. Thank We'd you. all be out of business if it weren't for artists. Yeah. Yes. And then you went on to make art from those piles of sawdust. <laughs> yes. So, that, so it was, it, there was a silver lining. You know. I told you I have collected over the years, including here. <laughs> so thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone else? Hello. Um, what um, would be a vital component to creating a successful gallery? And knowing, keeping in mind the fact that it's probably one of the most challenging venues or businesses you could possibly want to create, what would be like a vital um, other option, an alternate option to that venue to like basically further the move, further art as a movement, like and support artists? A com commercial gallery, a, a nonprofit gallery, or an alternative? space sort of in general or like just like a venue in general you know knowing like it's hard to generate income you know uh, like for a art venue specifically like so what would be a like a specific component that would make it successful essentially anyone want to tackle that it's a mystery question <laughs> it's a good <laughs> excellent question because frankly, I'm seeing a huge amount of DIY spirit, not just in this city, but all around the world right now, because one thing you were talking about, cities and their urban experience, I'm finding that many artists are being shoved out by the city rents, and like more and more being shoved to the suburbs, and you know, Staten Island now, and Jersey City, and in London I'm seeing, and Paris, um, that, that kind of very DIY spirit is kind of replacing sometimes the more institutional uh, kind of strongholds, because even those institutional strongholds are being shoved out to the outer fringes of cities. So it's a very interesting time. I was actually talking to Michael right before this started about, <coughs> I feel like I've had my gallery for 10 years, but I, I lost my lease and I'm actually kind of sitting on the fence and seeing, I'm doing pop-up shows. Of course, I'm on a lot of internet platforms, um, but I'm kind of seeing how the fallout is. In the, and when he said that he doesn't see anything on the horizon that in this constant advance of technology, um, and attention spans of fleas, which our audiences are very, <laughs> people don't have big attention spans an anymore because of the internet, because of art fairs, um, because of just the overload of data. So I, this is my year to kind of sit back and look carefully and digest and see how I can then maneuver the next iteration of what I do. Um, you know, I think these are real interesting times, but also these are the times that artists really lead the charge. I mean, I, I've always looked to artists to lead the way not the galleries or the institutions, so. Might have to get back to you in 10 years <laughs> when, when we figure out the Kickstarter. <laughs> Kickstarter, yeah. Oh, I've heard like people don't like doing Kickstarter no, anymore. No. <laughs> but the, the for-profit model, I think, is one that artists are adapting, uh, you know, the, I think the not-for-profit um, model has maybe run its course, so. Well, it's certainly easier to have an LLC than a 501c3. Yeah. So. I'm sorry, I'm artists too. A great cache of artists, which I think you've all expressed tonight. We've always followed the artists as well. We've got a great group upstairs, great group in our galleries, um, and we are proud of the work that we do to support them in this community. I want to thank you all so much for coming here and talking about us. I mean, <laughs> 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 good to, to uh, get Michael's questions and to hear all of your responses and um, 
yeah, you you guys have set us up for a really successful future, and, and we appreciate it. And thanks, everyone, for coming. Notes you took. Well, I just, well, there is a running, yes. You did, you did great. No, no, no. I just